Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about Robert Christie. Robert Christie died recently at the age of 96, and he was probably the last surviving major scientist of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the all-out American effort to develop the atomic bomb that began in 1942 and extended until 1945 when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Robert Christie was a theoretical physicist, although he didn't start out as a theoretical physicist. He was Canadian from British Columbia, and he was a young genius in mathematics. In the 1930s, there was no theoretical physics in Canada. The only theoretical physics being done in the world at that time was in the United States and in Europe. Most of the European scientists doing theoretical physics were German Jews, and when Hitler came to power, most of the German Jews emigrated to the United States. As I said, Christie was a brilliant mathematics student in British Columbia, and he was attracted to the United States to study at Cal Berkeley under J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was one of the great theoretical physicists in the United States at the time. When Christie finished his graduate studies at Cal Berkeley, he went to the University of Chicago, where the genius Enrico Fermi performed the first controlled nuclear reaction under the stance of the football stadium. At this point, the United States was organizing the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb under the direction of General Leslie Groves, who was a military engineer. Groves picked J. Robert Oppenheimer to head the program, and Oppenheimer selected some of the great physicists of the day, most of whom had emigrated from Germany, and he also picked some young, enterprising physicists, including Christie, to go to Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the main work on the bomb was to be done. There were actually parallel projects going on on the work on the bomb, with uranium as a fissionable material and plutonium as a fissionable material, and there were ancillary sites, one at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and one at Hanford, Washington, and these were all top secret. Christie went to Los Alamos with Oppenheimer, where he worked under Hans Bethe, who was one of the German physicists, a genius who won the Nobel Prize, and he also worked alongside Richard Feynman, probably the most brilliant of the young physicists, who also won a Nobel Prize. You'll remember we talked about Feynman when we did a Roger Beaujolais podcast about the Challenger disaster, because Feynman was on the investigating committee and figured out that it was the O-rings and the cold temperature that did it, and he did a very elegant, simple experiment. Working under Beta, Christie's main job was to figure out a trigger for the bomb, and he actually came up with a unique solution to the problem of fissionable material. He's one of the ones who estimated pretty accurately how much uranium-235 they would use, and his trigger for the bomb was called the Christie Gadget. Here is the story of the Manhattan Project, and Christie was one of the scientists at Alamogordo, New Mexico in July of 1945 at a site Oppenheimer codenamed Trinity, where the first atomic bomb explosion occurred. Grove selected a bomb design site in Los Alamos, an isolated location in the mountains at an elevation of 7,000 feet and accessible by only one road. General Grove wanted it to be beautiful where he said he could keep a bunch of prima donnas amused. In November of 1942, the Army purchased 54,000 acres for $440,000 under the guise of using them as a demolition range. To head up the installation, Groves, an expert judge of men, chose a most unlikely candidate, J. Robert Oppenheimer. A gifted physics professor, Oppenheimer had a reputation for being temperamental, perhaps not suited to a highly stressful assignment. It was advised that Oppenheimer would be a disaster. Uh, people told him that Oppenheimer couldn't run a hot dog stand. Oppenheimer was a fascinating and complicated. Fundamentally, he seems to have had some of the qualities of an actor. He was different things to different people. Oppenheimer drew luminaries like Enrico Fermi, Hans Bethe, and Edward Teller to the facility, as well as technicians fresh out of college. During the fall of 1942, the theoretical physicists at Los Alamos began the difficult process of trying to determine how much U-235 it would take to make a bomb. On December 28, 1942, President Roosevelt approved an additional $500 million investment in the Manhattan Project. The first priority, to build the massive industrial facilities that would produce the fissionable material to fuel the atom bomb. Robert Oppenheimer's team of physicists doubled the amount of uranium-235 thought necessary to achieve critical mass and sustain an explosive chain reaction. The scientists at Los Alamos also studied tampers, barrier materials that would slow the expansion of the critical mass and reflect neutrons back to feed the fission process inside the bomb. Design work was underway on the gadget, 
as the test bomb came to be known. The main obstacle was how to quickly assemble two smaller subcritical masses into one larger explosive one. The bomb design that they came up with was a gun design. Inside the bomb, a cannon would fire one piece of radioactive fuel into another at 3,000 feet per second. The pieces would have to come together fast enough to prevent spontaneously emitted neutrons from melting the fuel, causing the bomb to fizzle rather than explode. But the engineering aspects were daunting. It's one thing to say you can shoot a piece of uranium at a second piece, but how do you do it? How fast does it have to go? How do you stop it at the end? How do you keep it together long enough as a mass so that it does go high order and give you an atomic bomb? Oppenheimer led the effort to overcome these obstacles by setting an example for his team at Los Alamos. As scientists refined the design of the gadget, a new man-made element, plutonium, was gaining favor as a possible fuel. Identified in 1941, plutonium was almost twice as likely to undergo fission as uranium-235 and could be produced on a large scale by irradiating uranium in nuclear reactors. In order to produce plutonium, three production reactors were designed by engineers at the University of Chicago that would be built in Hanford, Washington. So the government went in and, and uh, bought up a half a million acres out in the desert of eastern Washington, created this remote construction site, and literally in a matter of months constructed large-scale uh, engineered structures for plutonium production. But Groves was not content to rely on just two approaches, Y-12 and Hanford, to produce the weapons-grade fuel for the bomb. By September 1943, he had begun construction on a third, K-25, a gigantic gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge. In the diffusion process, a gaseous compound, uranium hexafluoride, passes through a cascade of barriers, each one giving a slight enrichment of the lighter isotope U-235. It was looking less and less likely that enough U-235 could be produced to impact the war. At the same time, the alternative, plutonium, was proving to be equally tricky. Impurities in this new element were leading to increased neutron activity that would cause bombs to pre-detonate, to fizzle before the two halves joined in a critical mass. There are production problems at Oak Ridge. They're not sure they can even make any uranium at that point, uranium-235. And so, if they can't use plutonium in a gun, there may, in fact, not even be an atomic bomb. It's a real crisis. It's at that point that uh, I think Oppenheimer's talent comes to the fore, where he brings in the people, new people, in fact, and he reorganizes Los Alamos, that brings people in to solve the problem of how to make a plutonium bomb. The plutonium bomb's new configuration called for an outer shell of explosives that would direct symmetrical shockwaves inward compressing a subcritical central mass of plutonium. The resulting increase in the density would shrink distances between nuclei, thus starting the explosive chain reaction. By late 1944, K-25, the gaseous diffusion plant, was producing enriched U-235 that ran through the magnetic calutrons to effect a further enrichment. This one-two punch generated enough fuel for one gun-type bomb. But if, as military strategists thought, it would take more than one bomb to break the enemy's will. Then it was crucial that the upcoming test of the new plutonium implosion bomb work. All this uncertainty only served to heighten tensions at Los Alamos, as scientists and engineers prepared for the first detonation of an atomic weapon. If the implosion design was successful, it might bring an end to the war. Weapon design for the uranium gun bomb was completed by February 1945. Confidence in the weapon was high. They named it Little Boy for its relatively small size, 10 feet long and less than 10,000 pounds. Designers considered a test prior to combat use unnecessary and impossible since there was only enough U-235 for one bomb. The design for the more complicated plutonium-fueled implosion device dubbed Fat Man for its rotund shape was approved in March and a test was scheduled for July. On the morning of July 16, 1945, in the New Mexico desert, 200 miles south of Los Alamos, scientists and dignitaries awaited the results of the first test of an atomic weapon. Oppenheimer had given the test of the implosion device the code name Trinity, a reference to a devotional poem by 17th century English poet John Donne. The poem explores the paradox of a god that destroys 
in order to renew. The scientists waited anxiously at their posts. Some feared success because of speculation that the bomb might ignite the atmosphere and destroy the world. All the scientists were 20 miles away, but most feared a dud, especially since a blank test of the explosive surrounding the core had failed just days before. At 5.30 a.m., July 16, 1945, the world entered the atomic age with an intense flash, a sudden wave of heat, followed by a tremendous shockwave. The ball of fire extended 40,000 feet. The bomb packed a punch equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT, the high end of most of the scientists' predictions, completely vaporizing the steel tower and heating the desert sand into glass for a radius of 800 yards. It became brighter and brighter and rose, and I knew that soon it will be used over, over Japan, and then it will not be just an experiment. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. August 6, 1945, at 8.15 a.m., the gun model uranium bomb, Little Boy, dropped from bomb bay doors of the Enola Gay. 43 seconds later, the bomb detonated 1,900 feet above Hiroshima with a force of 12,500 tons of TNT. Here's an interview with Oppenheimer 20 years later on a documentary about the Trinity explosion and what the scientists present thought. Think of the world would not be the same. Few people laughed, few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that. One way or another. Those are among the most famous words of the 20th century. After the war, Robert Christie was still a young man, went to Caltech, and he spent the rest of his career there. And one of the things he did was he studied the effects of radiation on the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in the 1970s. So Robert Christie was one of our last remaining links to the Manhattan Project and the development of the atomic bomb. Here's Eric Lomax, a Japanese prisoner of war during the war, who felt his life was saved by the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, on the question of the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure I'm speaking for 99.99 recurring percent of uh, FIPOs, mm. we are uh, sure that was the right thing to do. It caused much damage where the bombs fell, but it was a lot less damage than would have been caused to us mm. as prisoners of war. They have uh, uncovered, many years ago, they've uncovered uh, from the Japanese archives orders that uh, in the event of Jap Japan losing the war in a conventional way, mm. that the prisoners of war would have finished up in those trenches around the camps and we would have just been mowed down and killed. You didn't know this at the time? No, we didn't know this at, at the time. These are the, tre the trenches around the camp. Out easily. That's right. Well, well, they actually had another purpose. They were graves planned for you. The uh, machine guns in the corner, in each of the four corners, that would have been the end of us. If the fighting had gone on, it would have cost very considerable lives in the Allied forces, the Americans and the British, uh, fighting, British were fighting in Burma, the <clears throat> Americans were fighting in the Pacific. I've heard since I'm home of many of my friends who were in the army after the day they were under orders to be uh, shipped out mm. to Singapore and that area. Yeah. Um, so they would have been subject to becoming casualties. Mm. It's not terribly well known, but the Americans had bombed 
Japan very heavily, Tokyo had been very heavily bombed, calamitous uh, deaths by bombing of Japan, mm. and if the war hadn't finished by the dropping of the atomic bombs, two atomic bombs, uh, these bombings of Japan of the homeland would have continued the civilians mainly the civilians in Japan would have suffered far, far worse than they suffered at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You think Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, frightened the Japanese into surrendering and letting you go home? Undoubtedly. Mm. No question about it. Mm. Uh, that was the reason that the Japanese finally caved in. The British prisoner of war Eric Lomax died recently at the age of 93, and here from The Guardian is the amazing story of how he met and forgave his Japanese captor years later. The experience of three and a half years of slave labor and torture as a prisoner of war of the Japanese on the notorious Burma-Siam Railway dominated the rest of the life of Eric Lomax, who had died at the age of 93. His 1995 memoir, The Railway Man, is a classic of its kind. It was only when he was in his 70s that Lomax achieved a kind of peace by meeting Takashi Nagasi, one of the men who had interrogated and tortured him, and striking up an unlikely but profound friendship with him after they met in Thailand. Lomax's unit was in Singapore at the end of 1941 when the Japanese launched their great assault across a front stretching from the Malayan Peninsula to the Central Pacific. An all-conquering lightning march down the Indochina Peninsula brought 30,000 Japanese troops to the Strait of Johor between Malay and Singapore Island. The British garrison numbered nearly 140,000 but was in total chaos, under-equipped, with no aircraft or tanks, demoralized and disorganized. General Arthur Percival surrendered the island on the 15th of February 1942, the greatest defeat in British military history. The prisoners, British, Australian, Indian, and Malay, were initially forced marched to Changi, which rapidly became an overcrowded and insanitary concentration camp. From there, many thousands went to Burma to work on the railway to Siam, now known as Thailand, in appalling conditions. Brutal interrogations and gratuitous torture became routine. Despite their suffering, Lomax and fellow prisoners managed to build a radio to try to keep in touch with the progress of the war. They also drew up a map of their area of confinement with a view to escape. But in August 1943, they were caught, ten men were arrested, severely beaten, two died, and they were moved to a special prison for prolonged torture. Lomax escaped by throwing himself down a flight of steps in order to be sent to the hospital. One in three prisoners of the Japanese are estimated to have died. Lomax thought David Lean's admired 1957 film, The Bridge on the River Kwai, was a sanitized epic that fell short of the truth. The censors never would have allowed the reality to be shown, he felt. People thought I was coping after the war, he told an interviewer later in life, but inside I was falling apart. I had no self-worth, no trust in people, and lived in a world of my own. Privacy of the torture victim is more impregnable than any fortress. He admitted that in some ways his family was made to pay for his suffering, and that conceived an intense and implacable hatred for the Japanese people. His first marriage broke up under the strain. Lomax dreamed of getting his hands around the neck of his tormentor and beating him to death. On his retirement, he embarked on a long and painstaking process of research looking for the man who had tortured him. Nagasi turned out to be still alive and engaged in charitable work. He had even built a Buddhist temple in Thailand to atone for what he had done in the war. Lomax sought support from the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture, which is now Freedom from Torture, which helped him surmount his memories and attain a kind of catharsis. Encouraged by his second wife, Patty, who made the initial contact by letter, he went to Thailand a few years later to meet Nagasi on seeing his compassionate, apologetic reply. They met at the bridge over the Kwai, an event which was filmed as part of a prize-winning documentary. Lomax had arrived in anything but a conciliatory mood, but he was taken aback by the deep contrition of the Japanese veteran. After a few days of each other's company, they got to talking and even laughing about their wartime experience. Lomax's autobiography appeared in 1995 to great acclaim, winning two literary prizes. The book is an unusual memoir in that it includes the results of interviews with witnesses as well as an account of Lomax's own experience. A forthcoming feature film will star Colin Firth as Lomax and Nicole Kidman as his wife. Well, I want to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps, and here's the closing song about Eric Lomax by the Broken Spokes called Railway Man. I laid those rails across the Burmese land For nearly 50 years I searched for the man Well, we met on the bridge over the river Kwai I remembered his voice, he remembered my eyes Railway Man the pain doesn't end with the act For redemption I just had to go back